Jesus' name, amen. Morning. It was it's good to be here again. I want to say thank you to the Norwich Park worship team for coming and um, ministering to us in worship and also leading us to the presence of the Lord. Uh, it, you know, isn't it great to be part of one church that meets in 27 different locations all throughout the Chicago land area and also nine different other locations throughout the world? Uh, it's amazing to be part of a, a church like this. Uh, my wife and I have been here for a long, long time. I would say like 35 years, something like that. Like, Lord, where does the time go? Um, but how many know the time flies when you're having fun? And we've seen the days go by so quickly. And so I'm super grateful to be part of this church and uh, to be part of this family. Uh, last week we took a pause, and how many know it was Valentine's Day? How many of you enjoyed that time? Uh, we were able to communicate some different things and hear from different people uh, about the area of relationships. 90% or 90, 95% of it is, of our life involves relationships. And I found that as I meet with people, it's very hard for some of us to really relate to others or to really have good relationships. And so I, I thank God for the, the, uh, those who stood up and were able to be able to share that way. Uh, we're in a series called Becoming, part three. We're going through the book of Philippians, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian believers uh, who were in Philippi, the city of Philippi in the Bible times. And um, we've been going through it. We happened today to come upon the passage that is really a powerful passage about speaking of who Jesus is. I've titled this message, Take on the Same Attitude. You know, attitude's interesting. You can have a bad attitude, a good attitude. Uh, life hits you, but you can choose the attitude that you respond by. Um, but as I was preparing, God brought to mind this. How I many know that Michael Jordan was, in my, in my estimation, was the best player that ever played basketball I don't know about you you might disagree some uh, some think LeBron but I don't know uh, we won't go there but Michael Jordan uh, how many know that he was rejected from the t varsity team in high school look at that he was rejected and it says that he went back to his room and he cried but then he determined something, and so there was an attitude that he chose to have. He went, he practiced, in fact, he practiced more than ever. He was brought back onto the varsity team, and the rest is history. In fact, they call him the heiress, or the fact that he's like this ultimate basketball player. And I wouldn't doubt it, but here's the reality. That's only earthly, but there's something powerful that... If you and I were learning about what it means to become like Christ, the minute that you and I are born, we, we uh, begin born again of God's spirit. When God, we turn from our sins, we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we acknowledge who he is and we receive that forgiveness that he went to the cross for our sins, that he paid this debt that we could never pay ourselves. And he went to the cross and he forgave us freely of our sins as we put our faith and trust in him. The Bible says we're born again of God's spirit. And the linchpin verse of this whole series is this. Philippians 1, 6 says this. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You can be guaranteed if you are, have been born again, you've trusted Christ. That you, God is working on you. That everything that happens in your life, 
that the work that God does, he's working it out for, like we sang this morning, for our good and for his glory. And we've looked at the past past, uh, scripture we looked at was this. It says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That our life needs to be aligned. That's what we looked at two weeks ago, that God calls us to be aligned. And how does that happen? That we need to be standing firm together in our faith. We need to be striving together as one. In other words, working together as God's people without being frightened when we face opposition. Some of you have been facing opposition in following Christ. Sometimes it comes from family members. Sometimes it comes from the culture itself. Sometimes it comes from society. And I believe that we're seeing that increase in our society. More and more we're seeing an opposition to the gospel. I've gotten spit on before. Not because they knew who I was. They never met me. Just the fact that I came in the name of Jesus to tell them a very simple message that God loved them. I've been spit on. Now go figure. I could take that personally and say, whoa. (laughs) I could get angry. I could spit back at him. I could have punched him. But you know what I chose is to keep quiet, walk away. Why? Because I deep down inside knew they weren't rejecting me. They didn't even know me. They were rejecting Jesus. The one that I I represent because he has become my king. In the Bible, this passage is, let's read this passage. It's so powerful. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. And this is what it says. It's coming from the ESV. Um, It says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, And of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Powerful, powerful passage. Uh, If the Bible, Tim Keller says this about this passage. He says, if the Bible were mountain ranges, this passage would be one of the two or the three highest peaks. This is a high peak when it comes to the, 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 the written word of God, the scripture revealed. Why is it so powerful? Because see, here's a big idea today. To become like Christ and truly live a life worthy of our calling, we must learn to live with the mindset that Christ Jesus did. Jesus Christ lived here on this earth with the mindset. Well, you could say, well, he is God. Yeah, he was God and he is God. And when he was here on earth, he was fully God, fully man. But when he was here on earth, he lived his life in such a way. In fact, he taught his disciples. When somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other. If somebody asks you and takes your cloak, you know, ask for, he says, give it to him. Give it to him. There's so much powerful things. He says, Jesus said this. He says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. How many of you have enemies here? I mean, maybe we don't call them enemies, but they're people that are hard to get along with. And yet I find that today God could speak to you. God could change your way of thinking. Like Michael Jordan chose to change his mindset. He could, that could have been the last of Michael Jordan. He got rejected from the team. He was sat on the bench. He didn't make it even though he thought himself, I'm really good. He probably thought that as a little kid. I can guarantee you. He was good probably at that age. But you know what? The coach benched him. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to him. You know why? Because he had to learn the power of humility. 
There's something that we see in Scripture about humility. The opposite of humility is pride. Have you ever met a proudful person? That you could try to correct them, you could try to teach them. You maybe have a coworker that you're, you, you, you're, you, your whole goal is to train them. In fact, your boss told you, train this guy or train this woman. And you try to teach them something and they don't listen. In fact, they think they know it all. Have you ever met a know-it-all person? Those know-it-all persons that think, man. And here's the thing about pride. The opposite of humility is pride. Pride says this. It's all about me. You're a teenager and you think, man, it's all about me. Uh, you're a little child. And, and you know what? You think it's all about you. I mean, I had kids before and they think it's all about them. That life revolves around them. The problem is we grow up and we think that life revolves around us. Here's a very scary verse. This keeps me in line when it comes to pride. You know what the Bible says? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Is your heart humble or is it proud? Maybe God wants you to do that. But here this this passage is known as the kenosis passage. The kenosis means this, emptied. Emptied. It's imagine you taking a cup of water and emptying it, pouring it out over the ground. Emptied. Emptied. That's what this passage means. This word kenosis is called that. Jesus laid aside not his divinity, but his heavenly glory. He didn't, he didn't lose his divinity when he was here on earth. He was fully God, fully man. But the Bible says that he what? He poured out his heavenly glory. The privilege that, in, in, the way to understand it is he poured out his privilege of being God Almighty. And he didn't pull, ever pull the God card when he was here on earth. Do you realize that he could have called a thousand angels to take him off the cross? What happened? He chose to die. Why did he chose to die? choose to die? Because he emptied himself. He had an attitude of a heart that said, I, I follow this. And notice in the scripture, he says, hey, listen, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being full in full accord and of one mind. So the question is, what does it look like to live with the mindset of Christ? What does it look like? Because in verse 5, we see that we're encouraged to do something. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have that same mind. One, one, one uh, version of, of translation of the Bible says, have this attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. So the mindset is, is, is an attitude that Jesus chose. But what does it look like for us? I want to talk to you, and we're going to go through, and we're going to look five ways that, that, that what does it look like for us to live with the mindset of Christ, that, that attitude of humility in our lives. The first one is this. Living with the mind of Christ means that we make every effort to live in unity with one another. That when it comes down to it, where your faith is most fleshed out, it's not in your closet when you're praying. It's not when you're, when you're, when you're out there working and doing something. It's in the context of relationships. And the, the, the Apostle Paul says, listen, hey, if there's any encouragement in Christ, are you encouraged to be in Christ? Are you encouraged to have a relationship with him? Are you encouraged that you get to be part of his family? Um, if, if there's any comfort, do you find comfort in the love that you have experienced through God? That he accepts you, that he loves you, that he, he sees you now, not, not through your mess and your sin and your brokenness. He sees you through his son, Jesus Christ. If there's any encouragement from being united, any, any affection and sympathy, I, I like the message. Let me read it from the message translation. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others go, get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. 
Notice it's all about others, isn't it? It's all about focusing on others. I find that if you really want to look at those who are spiritually mature and have, are being more and more formed like Christ, is that we'll have the attitude, it's not about me anymore, it's about Jesus. It's not about me anymore, it's about others and their well-being. And what if every single one of us lived that way? If you're in a marriage, your marriage is going to... It's not about you anymore. The minute you start living that way, thinking it's not about me, it's about others. It's about uh, others seeing el- others be successful. It's about raising up others. It's like me being a floor so that other people can stand on my shoulders and be able to do greatness and do greater things than I've ever done. It's like John the Baptist. I love what his life, th- when he declared, are you the Christ? He says, no, 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 no. I- I'm just to prepare a way. I must decrease and he must increase. And so if you, are going to, you and I are going to walk with that mindset of Christ, that humility that he had, the humility he portrayed when he walked on this earth, oh, he was strong. Humility doesn't mean that you're weak, but he confronted sin with love. He confronted those that were even religious people, but he was firm. Why? But he walked in humility. Walked in humility and obedience to the Father. Paul is saying, reflect here for a moment. Since there is encouragement in Christ, if there's comfort, since there's comfort of love in Christ, since there's affection and love in Christ, then make my joy complete by getting along with one another. I don't know about you, but one of the worst things for a pastor is when people don't get along. That's the hardest thing in the world. It's like it's magnified from your kids. Like when you had kids and you have siblings and when they're fighting, it it makes you feel like, man, and you know what happens too is a lot of times, what have I done wrong, Lord? Am I doing something right? We always take it personally. But here's the reality. I believe every one of us need to cloak ourselves with humility. We need to uh, clothe ourselves with humility. The, the, the Apostle Paul in other, other letters, he wrote, wrote that, and he, and he gave this picture of us that it doesn't come naturally to you, that we have to clothe ourselves. We have to put it on. We have to say and to have a determination, I'm not going to be proud. In fact, you can pray, Lord, humble me, but that's a scary prayer to pray because when I pray that prayer, he humbles me. I'd rather humble myself than be humbled. I'd rather bend my knee to King Jesus than have to be forced to bow my knee. I don't know about you, but I I, I I want to walk in humility. I want to say, God, it's not about me. Listen, this church is not about me. I don't care if this church flourishes and gets big. And Listen, that's in God's kingdom. That's in his heart. What I care about is that people come to Christ, that, they, that they're born again of God's spirit, that they hear the message of Christ, that they, that they come alive in Christ, that they begin to follow Jesus, that they mature in Christ, that, they, that the greatest joy is like the Apostle Paul is saying to these people, listen, I have a great joy, but get along. See, pride breaks us up. Pride tears us down. Listen, even, even in, our, in, our, in our culture today, the politics, is, it's tearing even the church apart. Listen, that is ridiculous. That politics would tear the church of the living God apart. Why? Because it's not about a political party. It's about Jesus, an eternal kingdom that will never fade away. And we can never let that happen. And let's get along. If there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, then make our joy complete by being like-minded. What does it mean to be like-minded? That we may disagree about different things, but we come in agreement about what is revealed in God's Word. What is revealed about God? What is revealed about truth? That we come together. And I've always said we major on the majors and we minor on the minors. You may not agree with everything about Oh, what the scripture says. And we could interpret it differently. But one thing is for sure. Jesus died and he rose again for our sins. And he paid the price for our, oh, by his own precious blood, he died on the cross. That if those who look to him with faith, believing that they would be forgiven of their sins by receiving that eternal gift by faith, not by what you do. See, religion says, I am trying to get to God to be accepted. I'm going to pray enough prayers to be accepted. 
Some of us were taught in our traditions that you have to pray certain prayers that were made by other people to be able to what? Be right with God. And if you pray so many of them, talk about the confessional booth. You go to the confessional booth, and what happens? You, you, you confess your sins. Now, that is biblical that we are called to confess our sins to one another, not necessarily to a priest. We have a high priest, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And we come to him with that understanding. And, but here's the thing. But then the priest would tell a lot of people, which is false, because they say, well, if you pray this many prayers of these ones, that's going to make you right with God. God will forgive your sins. Listen, God doesn't forgive our sins about what we do, by what we do. It's only by faith that we are accepted only by us believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no one can come to the Father but through him. Secondly, what does it look like to live in, with the mind of Christ? Living with the mind of Christ means that we put others ahead of ourselves. I've kind of already said that, but it says this. Well, how does it play out? Verse 3 and 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. You know, this is where it gets nitty gritty. Selfish ambition is more of, I'm doing this because I want something. It's about me. It's me focused. It's me centered. I, I, I work hard at the job because I want my boss to see me so I can get ahead. I'm climbing a ladder and... How many know that if I climb a ladder, I, I, it doesn't matter how I get there. I want to get to the top. So no matter what happens, I'm going to push people down. I'm going to kick them out. You know, I'm, I'm, going to keep them, I'm going to keep going up because why? I have a selfish ambition that's more self-focused of me getting to the top of the mountain. It's like, hey, did you ever play King of the Hill? Don't, don't act. I saw some shaking of heads. When you and I were kids, we'd play king of the hill, man. And I wanted to be king of that hill. But how foolish is that? If you saw the hills that we would make the king of the hill, I want to be king of this hill. What does that mean? I want to be. It's about me. I, so that I can look at the top and I say, look at me. I'm king of the hill. And so what we do is push others out of the way. We kick them out. I would do anything to keep them off that hill. But... Like it or not, I'd always end at the bottom. God would humble me. Big boy John would come and he would push me off. My brother Mike would just flick me off. You know why? Because they were much stronger, much bigger. Listen, if you play that game, selfish ambition will never get you anywhere. Uh, it will lead you down a bad road. It will leave you down a selfish road, a lonely road. I found that when you and I live in true humility like Jesus, God creates a community around us. Because who wants to be around proud people? I like to be around humble people. And when there's humility there, what happens is it, it raises up other people around. Look, it, it's in everywhere. You see it in churches. Some pastors don't want to let anybody else preach. They don't want to let anybody else rise up at a small group leader. They don't want to let anybody else baptize that somebody. Why? Because it becomes about me instead of about Jesus. See, this is what he says. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Love people not for what you can get out of them. Love people for who they are. Love people where they're at. That's what it means. Jesus loves us that way. Isn't, Jesus didn't come and say, listen, you got to do this and this and this to be able to do that. And, you know, no, he says, listen, come to me as you are. I begin a change and transformation in your life. Here's a common equation in life that we see many times in, 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 in our culture. Me plus nobody equals success. Me coming to the top of the mountain, the hill, the king of the hill moment. Me plus nobody equals success. Listen, in the kingdom of God, it's this. Having the mindset of Christ is this. Me plus others, including enemies. Equals success. But how do you do that? See, we have to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ was fully focused on the interest of others. Jesus didn't have a focus about himself. He had a focus about others. Listen, why do you think when he went to the, right before he went to the cross, he was sweating 
as though drops of blood because he was in such agony. And he kept telling the father on his knees, praying, crying out to God the Father. And what did he say? If there's any other way, Lord, let it be. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And I can't help but think that when Jesus was there pleading the case before the Father and willing to submit to him, thinking about every single one of our faces, could it be at that moment Jesus was agonizing for you? Could it be that he had already a picture of you in his mind when he went to the cross? Could it be he is God? He was fully God, fully man. Understanding that you, at one point in your life, you reject him, but now you, you are coming to him and you're, you're taking steps of obedience to him. You're, you're coming and understanding the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ that the apostle gave his life for and all the disciples were, were martyred for, except for one died a, a, a common death. Every one of the other disciples and many others, even throughout history, have, been, have lost their life for the sake of Christ. But see, they didn't live for themselves, they lived for others. Do you live for others or do you live with a selfish ambition in your life? And it can be a subtle thing even in the church. What is your heart like? Does it care to build up others around you or are you trying to get somewhere yourself? Listen, that little king of the hill, that little hill is not worth fighting for. There's a kingdom that will never end. And that king is King Jesus that reigns. A third one is that we can find what does it look like to live with the mind of Christ. Living with the mind of Christ means that we embrace and imitate the same attitude that Christ had. Look at what it says in verse 5. Have this same mind among yourselves or the same attitude which, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. See, Jesus is fully God. He, he, he didn't lose his deity. He was fully God. All the time here on earth, he was fully God. But I love that he never used the God card. And whenever he did, he was always in unison with the Father because God... And his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are three in one, the Trinity. But here's the reality of it. Jesus never lost his deity. In fact, at that moment of history when he was born in human flesh, for all of eternity, for the future, he became flesh. God took on human form forever. Forever. Why is that important? See, you got to go deep into it because in Hebrews it talks about Jesus being the high priest that represents us. And how could God himself represent us if he didn't understand us? Jesus faced every temptation that you and I face, but yet he was without sin. The Bible says that he was the perfect lamb that went to the slaughter, that he went to be crucified. And he died in our place. Why? So that he could be that high priest in the order of Melchizedek, it says, that he can represent us, that he can understand what temptation is, yet he did not sin. They can understand the pain, the agony. Why do you think Jesus, God the Father, the Bible says God the Father turned his back on Jesus when what? When he died on the cross. The Bible says he became sin for us. Here's holy God, almighty, could not ever look at sin. But at that moment, there was the agony of being apart from his father. That intimate relationship of the Godhead, it it was that moment, there was the back that was turned. But how many know the resurrection was coming? And when Jesus rose from the grave, he defeated the enemy of our souls once and for all. So living with the mind of Christ means that we embrace and imitate the same attitude that Christ had. What was that attitude? Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. So we are in him. 
there's so, a phrase in Scripture that you see over and over in, in, in the letters that were written. In all the New Testament, you see those of you who are in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? That your sins are forgiven, that you are in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that you have been born again of God's Spirit, that you're in the family. Many scholars believe that this, this was a poem or hymn that was written and sung by the earliest church. Why is that rele- relevant? Because within the first 20 years of church history, Jesus was considered and worshipped as God. So it, some people say, well, now, they didn't see. The, even the Jewish people, they, 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 they ended up believing. There were so many of the monotheistic Jews of all first century people believed that Jesus was God. They were convinced. They were waiting for a Messiah. And they looked for him. And they believed in him. And they put their trust in him. Tim Keller says this, the last people that would believe that a human could be God was the Jewish, the Jews. Thousands of Jews believed. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews that believed and put their trust in Jesus Christ. And what happens when you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Oh, there's life transformation. My life changed when I acknowledged that Jesus is Lord, that he is God. That he's fully God, fully man, as the scriptures reveal. If Jesus is who he claimed to be, if Jesus is God, then everything changes, doesn't it? See, you have to make a choice with Jesus. You might be listening online to this. You might be here today. You have to make a choice about Jesus. You either hate him because he was a liar and a lunatic. You avoid him because he makes you uncomfortable. Or you adore him. Because he is everything we've ever needed or wanted. See, people have different reactions. To some, Jesus is like a, a, a fragrance of a beautiful perfume that is attractive. If you ever smell a cologne that's like, oh. Now, they've never invented a skunk cologne. But, but there's some odors that kind of like repel us. We won't go into any details. It happens all the time in many different circumstances. Skunks are part of that. But it either repels you or attracts you. I don't know about you. The more I get to know Jesus, the more I'm attracted to him. But you can't just like him. No, you must choose. You must choose whom you will serve. Start said this, there is no moderate reaction to Jesus' claims. You either fall in adoration and worship him, or you basically walk away, do your own thing, ignore him for your life. I don't know about you, what are you doing today? What are you doing today? Are you looking to look at his obedience, look at his humility, and seek to imitate that humility? Fourthly, Living with the mind of Christ also means that we walk in humble obedience to God, even to the possibility of death. Verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The two key points from these verses is, one, Jesus was fully human, meaning that he knows what it feels like to journey this earth. He faced hunger and thirst, love and betrayal, Hope and sorrow, frustration and disappointment, pain and death. He faced all of those things that you and I face. So he is here right now. The thing we can understand about that, that he's here right now, right here with you and I, and he understands what you're going through. Some of you might be in deep pain right now. But you know what? He understands your pain. He knows your pain. He knows how it feels. And yet he's promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. Another thing that we can see through this is that Jesus lowered himself. He tasted death, even a brutal, unjust, humiliating death. Listen, Jesus was not about himself because even when he was born, he wasn't born in a palace. It wasn't broadcast all over the earth. Nobody even knew the day that he was born except for shepherds that were like the lowliest class of the Jewish culture. They were the lobodies. Who did Jesus show up to? He was born in a manger. 
Not even in the hospital bed. Listen, of all those times, think about what he, 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 where he was born, who he was born to, a virgin Mary. Who, who knew her? They weren't the knowns. And look, look at Jesus was born that way. And then he also ends up being crucified, a horrible death. A death that was for criminals. You, you, if you really do research on crucifixion, it's a horrible death. You're not able to breathe. Your, your lungs, you start filling up with blood. There's, 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 you can't breathe and you're pushing yourself up. They made it so that you could push yourself up a little bit and there's asphyxiation. Eventually you just drown to death. Think about it. The crucifixion. Yet alone he was beaten beyond recognition, the Bible says. If you saw Jesus down the street with a bloody mess, you wouldn't even recognize who he was. And yet the God who created all those people who were whipping him, the Roman soldiers who whipped him, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Think about that. Why did he do that? Because he loved he loved you and me. And listen, if it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't be here. There'd be no church. There'd be no faith. I don't think the world would have existed until now. We'd have destroyed ourselves by now if it wasn't for Jesus. Because how many know that by sinful nature, anyone, any one of us are capable of the most horrific things? If it wasn't for Jesus, I often wonder, where would I be? I don't even want to go there. Because you know what? Years ago, I got off my little king of the mountain, and I joined the king of kings and lord of lords. And my life has never been the same. Oh, is it easy? No, it's not easy. Is it tough? Absolutely. And what is he saying here? He says, even he found himself to the point that, listen, there are countless people that even today are losing their life because of the sake of Jesus Christ. There's a real, genuine faith, and they, they are there to serve. Not my will, God, but your will be done. My question to you today with that point, would you even be willing to die for your faith? Is your faith really, I mean, if you're not even willing to die for your faith, are you really, really, really living your faith? And you know what? I don't know what the future holds, but there come, might come a time where we might have to. Look at what happened at Columbine. You know what the guy, the gunman, went up to that girl and said? She said he said this. He says, he asked her a question. Are you one of those Jesus followers? You know what? Immediately she responded, Yes. And there's journals that she was journaling in. And at one time, she was kind of like, you know, like this with God. I, I, I kind of have my faith. But, you know, as, as that year or even before that, God began to sharpen her faith, strengthen her faith. And when that time came of testing, she did not stop or hesitate once. And she didn't deny, deny Jesus Christ. My question, if you and I were tested, would be we would really, really be willing to even for the sake of the gospel, uh, lay down our life for the sake of his, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's a real faith. Lastly, another way that we know what it looks like to live with the mind of Christ is living with the mind of Christ means that we understand and know that Christ is highly exalted over all. You know, as the minute you start saying it's not about me anymore, we start realizing, God, it's about you. Listen to what verse 9 says. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That verse and that passage right there has helped me to know my position and my place. There's only one that deserves to have knees bowed down to. And that is King Jesus. 
The implications for us, Jesus lowered himself. The Father lifted him up above all names. So if you really want to go up, you must go down. Jesus said if you want to be uh, uh, great in the kingdom of God, you must be, learn to be a servant of all. Listen, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to go down. down. Down to your knees. If you want to become great in the kingdom of God, you need to humble ourselves. We need to learn how to walk in that attitude that Jesus lived by. The attitude that says, it's not about me, it's about you, Jesus. Jesus got up by going down. Jesus showed us what the way to go up is, is to go down. I have no control over my life. It's laying it out and saying, God, you are fully in control. My life is yours. I depend on you. By giving up ourselves, we find ourselves. Jesus said, if you really want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. See, so what does he mean by picking up the cross? It means that it's not about you anymore. That, like the Apostle Paul said when we, we were already read in chapter 1, uh, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. We are dead. If you are truly a follower of Jesus, we have been crucified with Christ. That's a past tense thing. When the moment that you came to Christ, we were crucified with him. When, we, when Jesus died, we died on the cross with him. And when he rose, we rose with him. That's why when we baptize and we do the baptism, uh, the, the, the baptism is a ceremony that it's, it's almost like marriage. Like when I come into marriage, uh, before I got married, I came in single. But when I left out of that place, I, came, I went out married. And it was a public declaration. Baptism is the same way. It's like saying, this is what God has done already in the inside of me. Now I'm taking a step of obedience because Jesus said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. There's a step. Are you living for him or are you living for you? Is it about my little kingdom or about his great kingdom? I want you to pause on that right now and think about it as we close our time. I'm going to ask us to stand at this moment as we wrap up. I believe God's calling us to begin to learn how Christ thought when he was here on earth. What he, what he lived like. What example did he lay out? The Bible says in Ephesians, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. There's so much in scripture that focuses on others instead of ourselves. And God is saying, man, some of you are here right now, and you're on your little hill right now, thinking that you're at the top of your game. But you're like a little ant hill. You're on a little ant hill and you're thinking, this is my world. This is my kingdom. This is, I mean, they could, you could think that way in your home. You could think of way, that way at your job. You think that you've arrived. Listen, till the day that Jesus Christ comes back or that he calls us home through death. It's always going to be about King Jesus. It's always been about him and it will always be about him. The thing we need to do is get off of our little hill and say, Jesus, it's not about me anymore. It's about your kingdom. It's about your majesty. And Lord, teach me how to walk with that humility. Teach me how, God, to live that way of humility and saying, God, it's not about me anymore. I must decrease now and you must increase. And I'm going to take a moment right now and I want us to bow our heads and I want you to think about where you're at right now. For some of you, if you died today, you don't even know that you would go to You don't have the assurance that you would go to heaven. But I can tell you right now that you could today. The Bible says for all of us, Romans 3.23, for all of us have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Every one of us before God are sinners. In Romans 6.23 it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of eternal life is, 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 is through Christ our Lord. The gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's giving us a gift of eternal life through his son Jesus. Maybe today what you need to do is say, Lord, I have realized I'm on my little ant hill. And it's been my little kingdom. Lord, today I decide 
by your grace to get off this hill and say, Jesus, I accept that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm a sinner before you, God. And I confess that I need you, Jesus, that there is no other way besides through you, Jesus. And you could pray this prayer of sincerity before God. This is not a prayer that will save you itself. It's not the prayer itself. It's you crying out with a sincere heart before God and saying, God, I am doomed without you. I'm a mess without you, Jesus. I need you in my life. God, would you not come into my life as you promised in your word that if I confess with my mouth, Jesus, that you are Lord and believe in my heart that, God, you raised Jesus from the dead. You've given me a promise that I will be saved. There's the confession. Because confession comes from what we believe. Do you truly believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins? 2,000 years ago. And that by faith you can receive. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself. It's a gift from God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Today could be the beginning of a new journey for you. So I want you to pray this prayer simply, you crying out before God and saying, God, I have lived a me kind of life, a selfish, ambition life. I lay it down, Lord. I want to be like a seed that falls to the ground and dies so that I can bear fruit. I want to become great in your kingdom, Lord. Teach me how to be a servant of all. God, I want to walk with that same mindset that you had. And so if you're really saying this, I, I want you to just repeat this prayer after me. The, it's not the prayer that saves you. Again, it's you crying out to God with the sincerity of heart. Father God, I understand that I'm a sinner, God, that I was born in sin. But I know that you came to die on a cross for me. And so today by faith, I receive this gift of eternal life. Come into my life. Take me off my, my king of the mountain and make me your servant, Jesus. For the rest of my life, God, I pray that you would work in my life, that you would continue to build me, that you would continue to be, help me get to know you in a deeper way, Lord Jesus. And so today, if you prayed that prayer in faith, and I want you to right now just confess Jesus as Lord. They kind of, see, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. If you prayed that prayer in sincerity, I want to challenge you. Share it with somebody. Share that fact that you took that step. Get connected to a small group with other believers that will help you grow in your faith. If you need help to be, get connected, reach out uh, uh, to our church, on, either on the website or call us. And, and we'll be happy uh, to, to you. Even if you want to talk afterwards, I'm here uh, to talk Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the fact that you've called us to walk in humility, God. And teach us how to do that, God. Teach us how to walk your ways, God. To walk in humility, to, to, to let our lives be about others, not about ourselves anymore. Uh, to walk in obedience to you, God. And, and help us and teach us how to do that, Lord. We need you. We're not afraid to say that, God. And none of us have arrived here, God. We're all on this journey. And so we want to thank you for that, Lord, and help us to learn how to get along and love one another uh, and, and be united together as one people. We just thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name.